Hey guys, welcome to season two of True Crimes and Weird Times. I'm Kim. I'm Ashley. Today, I'll be telling you about Michelle Notek, a sadistic woman who tortured and murdered her victims after welcoming them into her home. And I'm going to tell you about a man named Granger Taylor. He told friends and family that he was receiving communications with aliens and that he'd be traveling through space on an alien spaceship. Then one day, he just disappeared. Michelle Watson was born on April 15, 1954, in Raymond, Washington. She was the oldest of three children raised by their alcoholic mother for a short time before she later abandoned them. Oh. This abandonment devastated Shelley, and she began tormenting her younger brothers in response. So how old was she when her mom abandoned her? I couldn't find it anywhere. She was under 13, I know that much, but... Yeah, obviously old enough to know. Right. Yeah. Yes. So when she was 13, her behavior started to escalate because she learned that her mother hadn't abandoned them after all and that she was actually beaten to death. Oh, my God. And after learning about this, Shelley began stealing, setting things on fire, and apparently even filling her own shoes with glass. Oh, so, like, is this her trying to cope? Is this coping mechanism? I guess so. Most signs of Shelly Notek to me point towards her being a psychopath. Okay. Okay. And that just didn't help. So. Yeah. Later, when she was 15 years old, Shelly was sent to live with her grandmother after falsely accusing her father of rape. Oh. She didn't live there very long, though, because she eloped with her first husband at 17 years old. Ah, oh, jeez. Uh, yeah. Wow. However, Shelley's sadistic ways were eventually revealed, and by 1987, she was a twice-divorced mother to her two daughters, 12-year-old Nikki and 9-year-old Sammy. Ooh. And that was the year that Shelley married David Notek. He was a Navy veteran, a construction worker, and just kind of a good guy all around. Okay. By 1989, the couple had had their own child together, who they named Tori. Now, Shelly would routinely emotionally and physically abuse her daughters. Ooh. One of her favorite methods was something that she called wallowing. She would take them outside in the middle of the night and force them to undress roll in the mud, and Shelly would spray them with cold water from the hose. Oh, my God. Who does that? Well, Shelly does that, but... And that's just the beginning. Jeez. She would use that as punishment for things as small as just using the bathroom without permission. Oh my and God. she would do things to humiliate them, like order them to bring her a fistful of their pubic hair. What? She would make them sleep outside. She mm -hmm. regularly beat them. She would lock them in dog crates. And she even shoved Nikki headfirst through a glass door once, telling her, look what you made me do. Oh, God. She would then go through spells of love bombing the girls, which is a very common manipulation tactic of abusers. Right, right. And she would just shower them with, you know, praise and love. And she always made sure her kids had all the nicest clothes and possessions and the girls would always hide their bruises when they went to school and were always very popular with the other kids. Like, from the outside, they seemed like the perfect family. Right. God, that's awful. Now, the year before Shelly had her daughter Tori in 1988, Shelly's 13-year-old nephew named Shane Watson came to live with her and David. Shane's father was in and out of jail, and his mother couldn't afford to raise him because she also had her own drug addiction problems. Mm -hmm. So the Notex agreed to take him in and raise him. However, Shelley immediately began abusing Shane as well. Shocker. He was also subjected to the wallowing and the beatings. She would sometimes bind his hands and feet and apply icy hot to his genitals. <sighs> 
Oh my God. And in one instance, Shelly forced him and her daughter Nikki to dance naked while she laughed at them. <sighs> okay, well, great. That same year, just a few months after Shane moved in, Shelly's friend Kathy Loreno also moved in with a family. Now, Kathy was a 30-year-old hairdresser who had recently had a falling out with her family and had agreed to babysit for the Notex in exchange for staying with them. Now, Kathy had been friends with Shelly for a long time, and she had no idea of the cruelty that Shelly was capable of. She was even a witness in their wedding. I mean, they were pretty close friends. Then Shelly was very good at hiding. I was going to say, a lot of people are, yeah. It wasn't long before Shelly began abusing Kathy. Wow. So she would force Kathy to work around the house in the nude. What? She would make her sleep in the basement next to the boiler. Shelly claimed <sighs> this was because Kathy was binge eating at night while she was sleepwalking. <laughs> okay. But then they would also just make her take a bunch of sedatives before she would go to bed, which you think would negate the sleepwalking and the <sighs> basement would be unnecessary. But well, yeah, you'd think that was just an excuse. It was just about well, the torture. Yeah. She would also force Kathy to ride in the trunk of the car if they went anywhere. What? She would beat her and she and David would torture Kathy with waterboarding. So David was in on it too? He apparently was in on this one. I couldn't find a whole lot of evidence that he participated in a lot of the torture uh -huh. and abuse, but I did find a couple of sources that said he did help with the waterboarding. God. And they would sometimes duct tape her arms and legs together while they poured bleach into her open wounds. Oh my God. Now, the three older children in the house were aware of what was happening to Kathy. Right. But being kids, one, there's not a whole lot they could do. Right. And they've and, been brainwashed at that point, right? Like, oh, absolutely. This is how we live. Mm hmm. <sighs> and also, while Shelly was focused on punishing Kathy, mm -hmm. she would mostly leave the children alone. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. Mm hmm. That so, makes sense. Again, even if they kind of wanted to tell someone they would have been so afraid of their mother yeah. and so relieved that it wasn't them anymore. Like you can't blame them. Exactly. Now, Kathy, believe it or not, lived with the Notex for five years. <laughs> what? She was terrified of what Shelly would do to her if she attempted to escape. <sighs> and several of my sources said that a couple of her victims did escape and ran away mm -hmm. but Shelly hunted them down and manipulated them into coming back what dude what a charmer i guess right god then in july of 1994 kathy loreno died while locked in the laundry room after a severe beating oh god she had lost over a hundred pounds and most of her teeth during the time she spent with the no tech <sighs> Shelly had then convinced her husband and children that if anyone discovered what happened to Kathy, they would all go to jail. Well, yeah. So David took Kathy's body and he burned it. <sighs> he then scattered the ashes in the ocean. They never to this day have found any remains of Kathy Lorena. Wow. Now, Kathy's family reported her missing. And mm -hmm. the Notex actually told her family and the police that Kathy had just ran away with her boyfriend, some mystery guy named Rocky. <laughs> uh-huh. And Shelly would even tell people that, you know, she was still in touch with Kathy and that she was super happy living away with her boyfriend. Uh-huh. Now, Kathy's family actually hired a private investigator at one point to find her. Right. And... He was never able to provide them with any proof or definitive answers, but he did tell the family that she most likely had been murdered in the no-tech home. Oh, wow. 
Well, I mean, it's awful suspicious that Kathy, if she's living this great life, hasn't contacted her family at all, but Shelly, for sure. Right. After Kathy's murder, Shane, the nephew who had come to live with them, mm-hmm. he was 19 years old at that point. He showed Nikki, the oldest daughter, some photos he had taken of Kathy during her stay there. Oh, wow. Now, the Polaroids showed Kathy covered in bruises, like on the floor, being forced Uh to crawl around. And Shane told Nikki that he was planning on taking these photos to the police. Oh, man, don't tell people. Never tell people. Yeah, because unfortunately, Nikki then told her mother about the photos and where Shane had them hidden, which was inside a teddy bear. (sighs) God. So determined not to be caught, Shelly then instructed David to take Shane out to a shed on the property and shoot him. No. And that's exactly what he did. Ugh. In February of 1995, David Notek took Shane, who he had raised like a son, right. out to a shed and shot him in the head. Oh, my God. He then proceeded to burn his body and again scatter the ashes in the ocean, just like they'd done to Kathy. Okay, you can't tell me David had nothing to do with any of the other abuse. There's no way for him to shoot that guy point blank in the head Yep, without even thinking about it. He Someone you have been raising for the past six, seven years. Yeah, exactly. God. Shelly told her daughters that Shane had left to go be a fisherman in Alaska and that he was very happy with his new life. <sighs> of course she did. God. I mean, the girls believed her, but I think that they needed to believe her. Uh, yeah. I was going to say, there's no way that, like, Nikki, who told her about the pictures, didn't think something happened to him Mm -hmm. there's no way and i was actually reading about some interviews with the kids and nikki still to this day has a hard time determining why she made the decision to tell her mother but to me (sighs) it's so obvious i mean her mother was terrifying and she raised her and manipulated her her whole life no i completely understand that that off right yeah well, and then she, she was scared. Again, her mom told them all, if they find out about this, we're all going to jail. I mean. Exactly. So I get it. I totally get it. Later in 1999, Shelley's third victim moved <sighs> into their home. His name was Ron Woodworth, and he was 57 years old. And by this time, Nikki and Sammy, the two older girls, had both moved out. Okay. And David was away on a contract job 160 miles from home, leaving only Tori, Shelly, and Ron back at the house. Oh, wow. Okay. Now, Shelly quickly set in on Ron, who she wouldn't even let use the bathroom inside the house. What? She took away his clothes. She would force him to drink his own urine. (laughs) And towards the end of his time there, she actually made him jump from the roof of their two-story home. Oh, my God. How, like, I don't understand. How how good of a smooth talker can you be to get people to do that? Like, I don't get it. he lived with them from 1999 until 2003. (sighs) That's... Oh That's a long time to be tortured and manipulated. And I have to feel like at that point, like his will was probably just broken. Yeah. I mean, yeah. But still. Now, he did survive the fall, mm-hmm. but he landed on their gravel driveway Ooh. and he was very badly injured. Mm-hmm. After which Shelly, quote, treated his wounds with boiling water and bleach. Oh, my God. Ron lived with the Notex until August 2003, like I said. Uh And that was about a month after being forced to jump from the roof. Mm -hmm. And that's when he died from his injuries. Oh, my God. Shelly hid Ron's body in the freezer for four days until (sighs) David returned home and buried him in the backyard. So no no cremation and spreading his ashes? and Well, that was the plan. uh But... There was a local burn ban going on at the time. Oh, 
Okay. So their plan was to bury him in the backyard. Uh-huh. When the burn ban was lifted, they would dig him back up, burn him, do the same thing. Wow. Okay. However, that same week that Ron died, Tori mm-hmm. actually spoke with her two older sisters and she told them what happened. Oh. And the older girls encouraged Tori to look for some evidence, like find some evidence mm. that Ron lived in the house, that he was injured, like find something. Okay, yeah. And Tori went home and she found plenty of evidence that Ron lived there, including some bloody bandages. Oh. In the outhouse on the property. Oh. And that's when the girls called the police. Good for them. Tori, who was 14 at this point, was removed from the home by Child Protective Services, and they immediately went in and searched the house. Mm -hmm. It didn't take them long at all to discover the body of Ron Woodworth in the backyard, and they arrested both Shelly and David. Good. Now, David pretty much immediately told the police (laughs) everything. Wow. (laughs) He confessed to shooting Shane. He confessed to disposing of the bodies. He told them all of Shelly's abuse. Like, he just just was like, here, this is what happened. (laughs) Wow. There was one more possible victim of Shelly's that was never definitively linked back to her. Mm -hmm. In 2002... Shelley had taken over the care of an 81-year-old man named James McClintock. Okay. Now, James, at some point during this time, changed his will, leaving his $140,000 estate to Shelley once his black lab sissy died. Uh-huh. Sure, sure. And then, totally unsuspiciously, (laughs) James later died of a head wound after allegedly falling in his home. Oh, wow. Imagine that. Now, police did look into this, Uh but they were never able to actually prove that Shelley was connected to his death. Like, it legitimately could have just been an accident, but... Yeah, but the way everything else played out, I doubt it. And he just happened to change his will to leave her everything. Exactly. Now, David was charged with first-degree murder for killing Shane, and Shelly was charged with two counts of first-degree murder for killing both Kathy and Ron. Wow. But both of them accepted plea deals for lesser charges. Boom. And Shelly actually got an Alfred plea deal, which allowed her to plead guilty while also asserting her innocence. Uh And it prevented a trial that would reveal her crimes to the public. Gross. She, to this day, has not confessed and says she's innocent. Ugh, whatever. Now, David Notek was released from prison in 2016 after serving 13 years for second-degree murder unlawful Uh disposal of human remains, and rendering criminal assistance. Mm Mm-hmm. And here's the real kicker. Shelly Notek is scheduled for early release in 2022. Heck no. After serving 19 years for second-degree murder and manslaughter. That is some BS. No. All of that. And she's going to get out after just 19 years. That is disgusting. Now, Shelly's children do remain in touch with David. They've forgiven Ugh. him. And they consider him to be more of a victim to Shelly, uh-huh. kind of like they were. Yeah. But they do not speak to their mother at all. That's probably and a good move. all three girls are dreading their mother's release and have gone on record like they're actively going to the press and Mm -hmm. saying she is a terrible person. She should not be released. And she is very, very likely to kill again. Wow. Well, I mean, I would assume they would know the most. Yep. Well, maybe maybe they can go to court during her release and, I don't know, pull some strings. I mean, maybe, but. Yeah, I know. I mean, Shelly's going to be about 67, 68 years old when she's released. Oh, wow. Which is older, but not too old not to go 
kill some people. Right. Especially if she was capable of talking them into just doing these things. Yeah, exactly. Who says she can't do that again? Yep. And for her to only get second degree murder and manslaughter, like... Yeah, that's what I was getting ready to ask. Like, how? That's ridiculous. I I can only assume it's because they probably didn't have any real physical evidence. Well, yeah, you're right. That that Kathy and, and Shane had even been killed there besides, you know, David confessing to it. Jeez. Well, thank you for that truly messed up story. You're very welcome. (laughs) Granger Taylor was born on October 7th, 1948 on Vancouver Island. He was a rather large, stocky man. He's pretty big. So he was quite intimidating, but, I mean, his personality was just the complete opposite. He was really shy, really quiet. Uh, Folks said he was a bit eccentric, but overall, he was just a really nice guy, do anything for anybody. Sounds like someone I would have been friends with. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Now, he didn't finish school. He dropped out at grade eight, but he found jobs working at local mechanic shops And friends and family started to notice that he had, like, this uncanny ability to just fix just about anything mechanical. Oh, I have the opposite ability. Yeah, if I look at it, it's going to break. Yep. (laughs) Now, I mean, even as a kid, he was fascinated with machines. And, like, by his mid-teens, like, by 14, he had restored a car. He had restored a bulldozer to help with projects around the town. Yeah. He restored a steam locomotive. And also, yeah, by himself, like he was not taught this stuff. He just did it. And he restored a World War II P-40 Kitty Hawk fighter plane. Oh, my God. And like sold it. Like, that's just what he did. Like the the locomotive, he like pulled it out of the woods. It was like one of those just kind of abandoned. He literally like pulled it out of the woods and just worked on it. And then ended up using it around town to like give rides to people. That's amazing. I know. So, like, he was like the savant, I guess. Now, along the way, he'd made a really good friend named Robert Keller, who helped Granger restore the the plane, uh, but, you know, helped him tinker around with stuff all the time. And he considered Granger Taylor a genius. Like, he's... I mean, he sounds like one. Yeah. Uh, He's quoted as saying, in my books, he was a genius. I think he was a genius bordering on insanity, which we'll see in a minute. (laughs) Uh, okay (laughs) but i mean robert enjoyed spending time with him he like i said he helped him restore machinery but he just hung out with him talked to him whatever but he said that granger like took this work seriously like this is what he did right now around this time there was an influx of ufo sightings abduction stories think like area 51 roswell betty and barney hill you know the classics uh, the classics but This started making, you know, aliens and UFOs part of, like, science fiction culture. We're talking Star Trek. You know, it's it's coming around. Now, it was also around this time that Granger began talking to Robert about the same things. Like, he was very interested in all of that. And, in fact, he was so interested in it that he wanted Robert to help him build his own spaceship. And they spent almost a year building it from spare parts, like, from around local dumps or whatever, and he built it right in his what? backyard. Yeah. Like, is it supposed to to work? Um, or just look like a spaceship? I think it was just supposed to look like a spaceship. Oh, okay. Okay. Now, he apparently built this spaceship out of two satellite receiving dishes he found. And inside there was a television, a couch, a wood-burning stove. Like That sounds pretty cool, yeah, actually. I was going to say, I kind of want one. And Granger spent, like, a lot of time in there, almost like a kid would in, this, in a treehouse, you know. I mean, I'd spend a lot of time in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he spent his time in there obsessively learning about flying saucers, you know, how they're powered, how they fly, you know. He was just studying UFOs. <laughs> As one does. Uh, Yeah. I mean, I've definitely done it. Yeah. It's not to that extent. But, no, you know. not to that extent. <laughs> Uh, it's too much science for me, though. I didn't get very far. 
Now, Granger had also begun telling Robert of some strange dreams and messages he had started getting from aliens. Oh. Yeah. Now, he said he was getting communications from someone not from here, but from a completely different galaxy. He wasn't able to see them, but they would communicate to him mentally. So he was hearing these messages. Oh, no. Yeah. He said he would lie in bed and have like these, quote, mental conversations with them. And like he would ask questions about how they powered their crafts, you know. But the only thing that they would ever tell him was that it was magnetic. And they they refused to tell him anything else about that. Now, how old was he around this time? (sighs) Mm, He was probably in his 20s because I think he ended up disappearing when he was 30. Okay, yeah, because yeah. I was just thinking, man, I bet this is around the 20s when <laughs> mental illness starts to show up. Well, that's true. And uh, it wasn't very long before he disappeared that he started talking about these communications. So it was probably along maybe 28, 29, 30. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, like you said, I mean, this is uh, this is that peak time. Now... People who knew of the story thought that Granger was just kind of making all of this up or that it wasn't true in some form or fashion. You know, he's just really obsessed with these types of stories. Now, according to the Voss article I read on Granger Taylor, his family claims that Granger was actually doing a lot of acid during these last few months before disappearing. Oh, yeah. That'll also do it. Yeah, exactly. His sister, Grace Ann, says that he was even taking acid a few times a day. In those last few months. Wow. Yeah. But I mean, either way, Granger totally believed like he was in contact with aliens. He frequently spoke about going to outer space with them. And I mean, he said it with such confidence. Like, in fact, he told friends and family that he would be leaving soon, like just a day or two before he disappeared. Now, the night before he disappeared on November 28th, 1980, he had a very long discussion with his stepfather, Jim. He told him, like, told him how much he loved him, how grateful he was for everything that Jim had done for him. And unfortunately, he didn't get to talk to his mother, Grace, because she was in Hawaii at the time. She was taking, like, the first vacation she'd had in years. Oh. Yeah, so she didn't even get to see him. Oh, that's even sadder. Yeah, and in one of the articles I read, she was expressing regret. Like, she, she said, I wish I hadn't gone, like... I can't believe I didn't talk, didn't get to talk to him, you know. And oh, God, that know. breaks my heart for her. Right. The next day on November 29th, 1980, there had come like a huge storm on Vancouver Island. Like the power was being knocked out, like huge winds. It was really dangerous to be out. And it was during this storm that Granger Taylor was last seen. Now, Granger left a note before disappearing and it said, Dear mother and father, I've gone away to walk aboard an alien spaceship as recurring dreams assured a 42-month interstellar voyage to explore the vast universe, then return. I am leaving behind all my possessions to you, as I will no longer require the use of any. Please use the instructions in my will as a guide to help. Love, Granger. Now, on the back of this note, there was a contour map drawn of Waterloo Mountain, which was about 20 miles away from where they lived. But, like, to this day, no one has figured out the significance of this map. Hmm. Nobody knows why he drew it. They they searched there, right? Um, I would assume so. I couldn't I find... I mean, surely. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, that would be the first thing I would think of. I couldn't find any articles that actually said they searched there, but I would assume they did. Somebody did. Yeah. Now, unknown to anyone, Granger had prepared two wills with instructions for his parents, like he said. As the note instructed, it was to help them to distribute his possessions and money. He had at least ten to $30,000 in the bank. One article said he had $10,000 in the bank. Another article said that they had actually put $20,000 from where he sold that plane into the bank with it. So he had a Mm. nice amount of money in there either way. But strangely, the word death had been scratched out throughout the wheels and replaced with the word departed. Now, I don't know if this was his second thoughts like no i'm not dying i'm leaving or if he like specifically requested someone to write the word departed in there like no i'm Maybe not he dying just wanted i'm just leaving. To, like yeah like just reassure him right now of course police were called as you know as soon as they found out he's missing 
and they did a search for Granger. They knew that the last time anyone saw him was at a local diner at around 6.30 p.m. that night. A waitress noticed that, like, he hadn't been dressed for the weather, but she didn't remember if he spoke to anybody or, you know, what he ordered, whatever. She just remembered seeing him and just thinking Mm -hmm. that it was weird that he wasn't dressed for, you know, this awful storm outside. After that, no one ever saw Granger Taylor or his bright pink truck that he was known for again. Which is bright pink truck? Yeah, which is really weird considering you can't miss a bright pink truck. Yeah, it's pretty notable. Yeah. Now, a few places, a lot of places actually, mentioned the pink truck. One article mentions that it was a lot blue truck. I actually listened to Unsolved Mysteries on this one too. And uh, it mentions his bright pink truck. So I'm just going to stick with that. So here's the thing. Granger was considered an honest man. Like he never, he never had a reason to lie to anybody. He was always, you know, an upstanding guy. He always helped everybody in town. And he spoke so much about these aliens and like his departure that when he disappeared and no one ever saw him again, townsfolk just assumed he had actually left to do what he said he was going to do. He got on a UFO and he left. Like they really believed it? Um, I want to say part of it was just like they didn't want to think something bad happened to him. But like, Yeah, more wishful thinking. Yeah, but like they also kind of threw like a parade or something after 42 months. Like they were expecting him to come back. Wow. Yeah, they, they literally waited 42 months for him to come back. However, in a conversation Robert Keller had had with Granger one day, Granger told him that travel in outer space is a lot different than travel here. What could just take 42 months aboard an alien ship could be like years in our time. Robert said he felt as though Granger was actually sad about that idea, that he may never see any of his friends or family again, but like he had to take this trip. And who could blame him? I mean, yeah, I know. In 1986, which was six years after Granger's disappearance, local forest workers found what appeared to be a blast site near Mount Prevost, which wasn't, I mean, very far from Granger and his parents' home. They found human bone and truck fragments at the scene, and they were assumed to be Granger's. Oh. Yeah. Now, if I remember correctly, the bone fragments were actually too charred or maybe too small. They weren't able to be tested properly. Now, also, it's 1986, and they didn't have that kind of technology. hmm But this was a true blast site. Like, there was hardly anything left. Oh, wow. Yeah, so they couldn't actually test anything even if they wanted to. However... Granger was known to always carry around a stick of dynamite in his truck. Which... Wait, what? I'm sorry. <laughs> um, he always carried a stick of dynamite in his truck. And he used that to blast tree stumps when the need arose, I guess. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the official coroner's request said that due to circumstantial evidence found at the blast site, you know, Granger Taylor had been killed by a dynamite blast. Like... That's what it is. They assumed it's Granger. That's what happened. It makes sense. However, even though they found truck fragments like metal, they never found his pink truck that he drove. So How do they know it wasn't the pink truck? That's that's part of it. I mean, they don't know when where the other. But the pink truck was never oh. found. And Robert Keller insists that Granger had used dynamite numerous times and he knew how to handle explosives. But that doesn't mean accidents don't happen. Right. I mean, just leave a stick of dynamite out in your hot truck all day and then bump it around (laughs) as you're driving through the mountains. I mean, kaboom, you know. So if that was actually Granger's bone fragments found at the blast site, then why did he even go out there in the weather? Why was he even there? Now, some people believe that maybe he was just lonely, like a lot of... uh, Family friends were like, I wish I'd have invited him to parties and stuff. So maybe he wasn't so lonely. But, I mean, his sister believes maybe it had to do with the acid he was taking. Maybe he was just on a bad trip. I'll second that. Yeah. Uh, Maybe he, I mean, just truly believed he was preparing himself for interstellar travel. And he believed he had to shed his human form. Uh, Which could also have been the acid. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Now, again, his friend Robert believes that Granger didn't kill himself. Granger told him before that if he wanted to disappear, all he had to do was grow a beard and move to another country and nobody would ever know. But he probably wasn't on acid when he said that. Probably not. (laughs) 
But also, I mean, if he wanted to go to another country and disappear, why didn't he take his money? He had plenty of money to start over. But I mean, even though there's a formal, like, he died, no one really actually knows what happened to Granger Taylor. I mean, there were rumors that his body was found hanging in a tree near the blast site, but that defeats the whole purpose of not being able to test the bone fragments. Yeah, I feel like if they found the whole body, that wouldn't have been an issue. Right, case would have been closed. (laughs) Others believe that maybe he, like I said, just disappeared to start a new life. But like, why didn't you take your money? Right. I mean, unless he didn't think you needed it. I don't know. Now, (laughs) one of my other favorite podcasts, Mysterious Universe, has theories that range from aliens possibly blowing up his car so it looked like he killed himself. Or maybe government agencies finding out about his his genius, like being able to work on machines and recruited him. Also, according to Mysterious Universe, the region that Granger was from had also seen its share of UFO activity. In 1969, just miles from the Taylor's home, four nurses at the Coeken District Hospital saw a, quote, Saturn-shaped UFO with two humanoid occupants hovering inside the window. So, now hear me out, because I have to throw it in here. If we're on board with this alien UFO picking up Granger Taylor, what if they had been keeping an eye on Granger this whole time? Because remember, he was born in, what, 1954? Mm Mm-hmm. What if they've just been keeping an eye on him this whole time, and they knew who he was going to grow up to be, and then they picked him up one day when he was ready? I'm just saying. Hmm. (laughs) It's just real odd that they were pretty close to his home. Yeah. <laughs> I knew it. I knew I couldn't do it. <laughs> I thought I had you. <laughs> nope. I've already, I've already determined what I feel happened. Yeah. I think a lot of people have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's the mysterious disappearance of Granger Taylor. Thanks for listening. Like us on Facebook at True Crimes and Weird Times Podcast. Follow us on Instagram at True Crimes Weird Times. Email us your stories at True Crimes Weird Times at gmail.com. Can't wait for the next episode? Check out our Patreon for bonus episodes and more. And if you enjoyed the show, make sure to subscribe and leave a review. Bye!